Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. Don't put the lock on the door. Please, don't put the lock on the door. Dozens of residents find themselves locked out of their homes amid the coronavirus crisis. Doorknobs bolted with letters stuffed into doorways. It's a scene that wasn't supposed to happen amid the pandemic. Yet it happened anyway. Technically, the moratorium that stops evictions is slated to end on April 30th, but today the Bear County judge announced that order would be extended even further to delay evictions. Today's lockout is raising questions among the community along with the city and county. Judge Wolf says about 50 people could not get into their homes at the Almost Club Apartments. It's on the 800 block of Bassey. That included Luis Falcon's son. It's sad. It's sad when somebody put a key on the door. Even though they don't have money, they put for the two or three months. You know, right now, we don't need that. Now, this is the first really flagrant violation we've had of that. And um, we've asked the district attorney and other law enforcement to look into it and see what kind of options that we may have against the company that did that. Now, Judge Wolf has said this will be corrected under the eviction moratorium. Renters do have rights, and the city of San Antonio also has a new program to help with funding for housing assistance. We will continue to follow this story as it develops. Well, let's take a look at the latest numbers tonight. More than 20,000 people have been tested so far in Bear County, and tonight the county has 1,275 confirmed cases of COVID-19. 59 people currently in the hospital. 531 have recovered from the illness, but hundreds more still have the virus. The death toll increased by one case in the last 24 hours for a total of 44 deaths. The Bear County Sheriff's Office has two more inmates as well as two more deputies tested positive for the disease. That brings a total of 62 inmates and 34 deputies. 11 other people who worked at the Sheriff's Office have also tested positive. As we've reported, widespread testing underway at the jail but County Judge Nelson Wolf says only 150 tests can be done per day there. Well, it is today's big story. Retail shops, malls, theaters, and dine-in eating will be allowed by the end of the week with a cut to occupancy, as announced by Texas Governor Greg Abbott. Tonight, the city and county are reminding San Antonio this does not mean the crisis is over. Yeah, and while several businesses will be allowed to reopen, they will only be allowed to let in a fourth of the people normally allowed inside, a fourth of the occupancy. And while restaurants can allow for dine-in options, bars will not be reopened. So how will officials be able to tell the difference between a restaurant and bar? Under the governor's order, it, it makes it pretty clear that if your uh, sales of alcohol exceed your sales of food, then you're probably you're in the bar category. And the good news is, as I understand it, your actual license that you get from the state uh, determines which one of those you fall under. So it'll be it'll aid in our enforcement in terms of just looking at what their their current license says. Other businesses like hair salons, nail salons will remain closed. Tiffany Huertas has a look at the changes and how the city and county is responding. There's just things piling up, you know, um, mortgage, car, bills. Hairstylist Lisa White is devastated after finding out she can't go back to work this week. The coronavirus pandemic has flipped her life upside down. I applied for everything that was forwarded to me that I would be eligible for and have had no response. There are some businesses that I want to open, that Texans want open, that the doctors advised were simply not safe enough to open at this particular time. They include barber shops and hair salons, bars and gyms. We are working with our medical team as well as working uh, with members of the industry sectors to open these businesses as soon as possible. Today, Governor Greg Abbott said retail stores, restaurants, movie theaters and malls in Texas would be allowed to open, but they must maintain only 25 percent occupancy and follow social distancing. Also, the governor made it clear masks are encouraged, but not mandated. We make clear uh, that no jurisdiction can impose any type of penalty or fine for not wearing a mask. Everyone should be encouraged. Uh, but by my executive order, it supersedes local orders with regard to any type of fine or penalty 
for anyone not wearing a mask. County Judge Nelson Wolf does not agree. I think that the uh, worst uh, decision he made uh, was to not require mandatory use of face mask. We cannot impose a fine or a, uh, or a prison term or a jail term on that, but if we put in mandatory do it and we, we, we would have to go to our employers and make sure that they follow through on that. An employer has every right in the world uh, to say you can't come into my place of business if you're not wearing a mask. Tomorrow, city and county officials will meet to discuss a new stay-at-home work safe order. All I'm asking is to be able to go back to work. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. And right now on the weather front here, we do have a severe thunderstorm warning that's for Uvalde County. And one of the strongest parts of this thunderstorm is right in the center of Uvalde County and especially moving toward U the city of Uvalde and especially just south of it. The primary threat here is straight line winds up to about 70 miles per hour. Really not much of a hail threat with this thunderstorm complex that has uh, developed and moved eastward and you take a closer look at it and you look at the direction which is east at 40 miles per hour and uh, the strongest part of the storm is basically moving right along highway 90 there and it looks like Kanipa you'll be getting it about 10 16 p.m. So I'll have another update on this and talk about what the odds are of this making it to San Antonio and the I-35 corridor coming up. Thank you, Adam. Alamo College is coming up with a plan and a new plan to help students stay in college during this pandemic. There are four major initiatives for the Keep Learning plan. The program eliminates a student's outstanding balance up to $500 from the fall 2019 and spring 2020 semesters. There's also up to nine free credit hours of summer school for full time students with at least a GPA of 2.0. And fees set up to pay for payment limits for the fall were reduced to just one dollar. Plus the Texas Success Initiative test, which usually costs $32, being offered at no cost between May 1st and June 20th of this year. So can we expect more schools to implement similar plans that Alamo Colleges did? Well, is this digital way of learning here to stay? And how is it impacting students learning amid the pandemic? Tonight we bring in the director of the Urban Education Institute at UTSA for our coronavirus Q&A later in this show. Let's take a look at the cases of COVID-19 in our surrounding counties. Meanwhile, several counties reporting slight upticks tonight. Hayes County reporting 155 cases. Guadalupe County has 73. Comal has, Comal has 49. Wilson County at 30. Atascosa at 15. We're also tracking these cases online at ksat.com. In other news tonight, two separate murder suicides in less than 24 hours. The most recent one happening this evening around 7 o'clock when shots were fired on Perrin Vital near Sungate. Police say when they arrived, they found a man in the backseat of a vehicle already dead and a woman laying outside of the vehicle who was taken to the hospital where she later died. Police say they are investigating this as a murder suicide. Female was shot by the male in the backseat and the male killed himself. Uh, she was transported. Uh, I think she died a short time later after being transported, and the male was pronounced on the scene. No identities were released. They were only described as being in their 40s. Now to a triple murder-suicide. They were actually found by their father, who saw their bodies through a closed window. Police are also investigating this triple murder-suicide from earlier this morning, where some of those victims were young children. Still more questions that need to be answered in this one. The body is found inside an apartment off Henderson Pass near 281 about 830 this morning. San Antonio police believe a 38 year old woman who had recently lost custody of her children fatally shot her three year old son, five year old daughter and her own 68 year old mother before turning the gun on herself. Police were tipped off by the kid's father. They say he had been looking for them, went to the apartment to check on them, ended up finding their bodies after looking through a closed window. None of the victims' names have been released. We have a night beat update regarding a crash that blocked multiple lanes of traffic and ended in two arrests. This was a scene, if you remember, on Friday night. Traffic was at a standstill after a crash on I-37 and I-10 near on, on the southeast side. Police now telling us the wrong way driver who caused the crash was arrested on a DWI charge. He was identified as 22 year old Joshua Des Baziles. Police also say the driver who was hit was identified as 61 year old Jesse Klassen and was also arrested on a DWI charge. Both had minor injuries. 
He had a heart for helping others while living his life to the fullest. That's how family and friends described 37 year old motorcyclist Michael Guerra. He was killed in a seven vehicle crash on the south side over the weekend. The night team's Jaffney Gray spoke to his brother and neighbor who said they will never forget the things that Guerra stood for. There was nobody else like him. That's all I could say. Really, he uh, he anything he did, he did 100 and 11 percent. This man who asked not to be identified is the brother of 37 year old Michael Guerra, a motorcyclist who would tragically make his last ride Saturday afternoon on Southwest Military and South Flores Street. I was in the garage. I was working on uh, working on a bike and I got a call. San Antonio police say this delivery truck was traveling behind Guerra and another car. Police say the driver of the truck claimed to have had a brake failure, causing it to hit the car behind Guerra, which then crashed into Guerra's motorcycle. The impact was so hard, Guerra's bike was thrown 40 yards. You know, I think even 48 hours later, I'm still processing. His loved ones say Guerra had a major impact on his community, especially when it came down to fixing motorcycles. He dedicated a lot of time to helping out with uh, nonprofits. Uh, one of them was like a build a bike program. Guerra was like family to his neighbors. Well, he was a very encouraging uh, man, um, you know, uh, a hero type guy, a community driven, family oriented man. He felt anything that was worth doing was worth overdoing, and God loved him for it. Riding his motorcycle was his life. That's actually what kept him as grounded as he ever was. Guerra's brother says while he hopes his death serves as awareness for motorcycles on the roadways, he wants people to cherish the ones they love. If you think it's not going to happen to them or it never will, it does, and it did. Uh, so just treat every moment like it's last. Jaffany Gray, KSAT 12 News. You're still ahead on the night beat the effort to keep hands healthy among medical providers. What two local laboratories are doing amid the pandemic? And how the pandemic is impacting our students and could this change the way others learn in the future? We bring in the experts for our coronavirus Q&A. And how are local families coping while taking care of relatives with special needs? It's next on the night beat. COVID-19 has increased stress for a lot of us. It's also hitting families with special needs, especially hard. The daytime rehabilitation centers they're used to accessing are currently closed. The night team's Patty Santos tells us how families are now preparing for the reopening of the state. Hi, Matthew. How are you? Fine. Are you bored at home? Uh, a little bit. Matthew's mom, Margaret Constantina, tells us her son is missing the socialization he's been used to for 25 years at the Ark of San Antonio. Many of our family members who depend on the Ark do not have access to child care outside the home. Uh, my son's 38. He still needs to have daycare. Uh, that isn't available anywhere else. Matt has cerebral palsy, intellectual and developmental disabilities, seizures, and he can't walk. Have a good day. He hasn't been to therapy for nearly two months. A massage is real important for him because he doesn't have very good circulation. What are you doing, Matt? Playing video games. Okay. Luckily, the Constantino family has been able to work from home and care for their son. The pandemic has put a strain on families with unique needs like theirs. Many, many People with intellectual and developmental disabilities are isolated. They're isolated because of their needs, because of a lack of transportation or ability to do some of the things that you and I don't give a second thought to. Mike Bennett, president of the ARC, says they're using Zoom and giving families ideas through their website to fight isolation. They shared these photos showing how participants are staying busy. The good news is Bennett says he'll be studying the governor's announcement to figure out a plan for when and how they can reopen safely. But because each individual has their own unique medical or behavioral needs, that may come with challenges. We have folks who, when they come back, they're going to be a little more capable of adjusting to a mask and to distancing. We have a lot of folks who are not. They're not going to understand why they can't hug their friends or why they have to wear a mask. So we're going to have some challenges. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News.
All right, we have been following some storms. Not necessarily in the San Antonio area yeah. proper, but mm -hmm. not that far away. Yeah, right along the border and then now east of the border in Uvalde County in particular. That's where we have one of the strongest parts of uh, this complex that developed and a severe thunderstorm that's in a severe thunderstorm warning that's in effect. So let's get right to it and chat about this. Looking first at the bigger picture and you see just that isolated area, but it's a lot of rain, a lot of lightning and it does have the history of some uh, pretty high winds. Not much in terms of hail, though, so that's at least one benefit from this system that uh, developed out west and moved across the border. So you look closely and you see this orange box. That's a severe thunderstorm warning. That's for Uvalde County, including the city of Uvalde, but just that basically central and southwestern portion of Uvalde County. And the strongest part of this storm is basically around Uvalde and just south of it with the wind threat now around 60 miles per hour. So that little chunk of the storm moving east about 40 miles per hour should make it to Canipa momentarily to Hannes at about 11 p.m. And if it stays intact, Hondo, you could see it at 11 15 p.m. I do think it's going to fall apart a bit and weaken as it heads eastward. We've already seen some signs of weakening. I do think we'll see more. Now, this whole comp complex and this whole line that we have here, this, that's moving eastward at 40 miles per hour. And even if it's not severe anymore, some leftover rain could even make it to Divine by 11 30 p.m. And if we're lucky, make it to the San Antonio area after midnight. Now, I don't anticipate we'll have much left of this at that point. Nonetheless, we could get in on some leftover showers from it. It drops some good rainfall in parts of Alverde County, especially just north of Del Rio and into neighboring Kinney County as well. Actually get north of Del Rio, Devil's River area. I got a report from Karen Hale of 1.5 inches and radar estimates are on the order of uh, one to one and a half inches in that area. So impressive. All right, so here's our future cast and it does indicate this thunderstorm complex dissipating as it moves eastward. Nonetheless, we could cash in on a little bit of leftover rain if we're lucky around and after the midnight hour here in San Antonio. Otherwise, just cloudy with a little bit of fog developing by tomorrow morning. 78 degrees. That's our current reading at the moment. We topped out at 90, by the way, for the high temperature and our dew points at 65. That's much higher than this time yesterday in the past couple of days. Southeasterly breeze coming off the Gulf of Mexico. It's been gradually increasing the humidity. You notice it outside now but you'll really notice it first thing tomorrow morning. Here's our future cast. Notice those dew points in the lower 70s by tomorrow morning. So that puts us in the oppressive category. With that extra moisture in the air, we can't rule out uh, some areas of fog and especially the low clouds to start the day. Now into Wednesday, we'll, we'll have a cold front that's gonna drop into town. So very early in the morning, still sticky and muggy, but look at this difference here. Whoosh, that north wind comes in, those dew points drop. And we're looking at some crisp mornings for the end of the work week. I wish I could say we had better rain chances with that cold front. 20% chance of a pop up thunderstorm tomorrow afternoon, 30% for the morning hours and the first part of the day on your Wednesday with that cold front. Otherwise, tomorrow we'll start at 71, make it to near 90. We'll have some afternoon sunshine and overall just very sticky and muggy at that southeasterly wind at 10 to 15. There's that cold front that hits on Wednesday. We'll still make it into the mid 80s with humidity falling off and a gusty north wind pushing in that drier air. So Thursday and Friday with that drier air in place, that translates into cooler mornings. We're talking 50s Thursday morning and Friday morning, afternoon sunny and right around the 90 degree mark. And of course, the humidity comes back, but not until next weekend. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right, does this at all indicate, Greg, that we could see the Spurs finish the regular season? Well, in this case, maybe the NBA just reopens. I don't know where they're going to reopen, be it the regular season or the playoffs, but this is the first step in opening the facilities. Now, that has now been delayed. The NBA was hoping to open up 18 facilities this Friday. That's been delayed, but not that far off. We've got an update on that for you. Plus, after making him the highest-paid offensive lineman in the history of the NFL, a Texan is talking. So I called my agent and Urban Wiener said, yes, it's a done deal, George. I'm going to fly you into San Antonio. You know, you, you are now a San Antonio Spur. He is one of the greatest all-time Spurs and is a legend in the NBA. Happy birthday to the Iceman, George Gervin, today, who turns 68 in big board sports, but first. 
On the heels of Governor Greg Abbott's announcement today to reopen Texas during the COVID-19 pandemic, the Spurs would be one of the early benefactors of that decision. The NBA announcing today that training facilities in states not under further restrictions like Texas can reopen as early as next Friday, May the 8th. Players can report on a voluntary basis. No group workouts will be allowed, but the facilities will be open. One thing the league officials are cautious about is not giving any teams a leg up on possible return to play. The Spurs have not suited up on the court since their 119-109 victory. Back on March the 10th, and missed a total of 19 regular season games before the playoffs were set to begin last weekend. There's been already been a report that it would take at least 25 days to restart the league, but the first it would be getting the players back into the facilities for individual workouts. Now, so here are the other restrictions. No more than four players at the facility at any one time. No coaches can participate. Group activity prohibited. Players cannot use non-team facilities such as health clubs, fitness centers, and gyms. Pro Football Government, powered by Davis Law Firm. For the first time since the Houston Texans made Larry B. Tunzel the highest paid offensive lineman in the NFL, Tunzel is talking. Remember, he came to the Texans for the start of the 2019 season in a trade with the Miami Dolphins that included two first-round draft picks. One of the reasons why the Texans started the 2020 draft in the second round. But before the draft even started, the Texans negotiated a new contract extension with Tunzel that will pay him $66 million over three years with $50 million guaranteed. And get this, Tunzel negotiated his own deal. It's a blessing just to be the highest paid uh, office alignment. You know, you always dream of, of times like this. And we got it done, especially not having an agent doing the deal by yourself and, and getting it done is extremely, extremely a blessing with any negotiation it was it was pretty tough you know they came at me in february trying to give me an extension and and we just got a deal done a couple of days ago so it was, it was tough but we got it done and, and it was fun just to just to be in that moment to learn different things Good to hear. The Houston Texans receiving high marks on the first draft for Bill O'Brien as the team's new general manager and head coach. His game plan was to bolster his defense after being run out of the playoffs by the Kansas City Chiefs after being up by 24 points. His first pick had to be in the second round after trading the first round selection for offensive tackle Larry McTunzel last year. And he chose defensive tackle Ross Blacklock out of TCU to replace nose tackle DJ Reader with the Texans' loss to the Bengals in free agency. O'Brien also used one of the two fourth-round picks to select cornerback John Reed from Penn State, who had 125 tackles and seven, seven interceptions in four seasons for the Nittany Lions. Look for death at the position after saying goodbye to 14-year veteran Jonathan Joseph. For O'Brien and Reed, it's a reunion. I've known John for a while. When I was at Penn State, he was a sophomore in high school and came to our camp, and I think we offered him a scholarship right there. Um, really smart guy comes from a great family um but i think he can yeah i think he can do both i think he can play on the inside and i also think that uh he'll help us on special teams you know so i, th I thought we that was a really another guy that we felt really good about that we had targeted and we were really hoping would be there and he, and he was there the cowboys may be left to california dreaming this summer next The Dallas Cowboys may be forced to abandon plans to return to Oxnard, California for the annual training camp due to the coronavirus. For the first time since the COVID-19 pandemic broke out, new Cowboys coach Mike McCarthy is bringing up the possibility the team may be forced to cancel their plans to hold training camp in California this year and instead at their headquarters in Frisco. McCarthy never made the trip to Oxnard as he had hoped to in mid-March due to the coronavirus outbreak then and did not get to see the layout that has worked so well for the Cowboys since 2012. McCarthy says they had to keep open the possibility of both sides with less in three months until training camp is scheduled to open. We've done some heavy planning on, you know, first, if, we, if we're able to go to Oxford, and then if we're not able to go to Oxford, you know, what's it going to look like, you know, if it's in Frisco? So that, that's, uh, that's been the starting point looking from training camp back as far as our pre-planning. The Cowboys were scheduled to report to training camp in California July 21st, one of the first two teams to open training camp this summer because they were set to play in a Hall of Fame game on August 6th in Canton, Ohio. That's where they were scheduled to face the Pittsburgh Steelers since both former Cowboys coach Jimmy Johnson and former Steelers coach Bill Cowher are among the class of 2020. We still don't know if that is even going to happen right now, so stay tuned on that. A lot of things still up in the air. Very much so. All right, thank you, Greg. Our coronavirus Q&A is coming up. We're discussing remote learning and the impact on our students. Next on the Night Beat.
As the cases continue to rise, many in the United States are looking for a way forward after weeks of stay at home orders. Some states have already begun lifting restrictions, others laying out a roadmap, all hoping to keep the outbreak in check. ABC's Romina Puga has more. As governors outline their plans for reopening their states in New York, the U.S. epicenter of the outbreak, the battle is far from over. Number of new cases, still 1,000 new COVID cases every day, puts it in perspective. In Massachusetts, another hotspot, Governor Baker announcing nearly 2,900 people have died, a staggering 56 percent of them in nursing homes. The numbers are tough to comprehend, but they illustrate the lethal grip COVID-19 can have on seniors. For the doctors and nurses on the front lines, a profound toll for witnessing so much pain. The New York Times reporting that Dr. Lauren Breen, the medical director of the emergency department at New York Presbyterian Allen Hospital, died by suicide. Dr. Breen had contracted the virus herself, recovered, and gone back to work. In hard hate Louisiana, though, a reason to cheer. For the first time in 36 days, no one in New Orleans died of COVID-19. Some southern states reopening their restaurants this week, owners welcoming back their employees. I'm kind of excited because these are my family. I get emotional. <laughs> But, you know, these guys need work. They need to make money. But health officials warn Americans should still practice social distancing despite leaving their homes. Over the weekend in Florida and California, crowds flocked to the reopened beaches. This virus doesn't go home uh, because it's a beautiful sunny day uh, around our coasts. And urgent calls from states pressing for reliable antibody testing in order to track the virus and help the country open up again. The testing that's been developed and, and being developed right now has been truly an amazing thing. But a new study of 14 coronavirus antibody tests found only three delivered consistently reliable results. Another reason reliable testing is urgent, the antibodies from those who've recovered from the virus could help treat those critically ill COVID-19 patients through plasma donations. In Los Angeles, Romina Puga, ABC News. It's the part of the show that we call coronavirus Q&A, and we actually ask your questions to some of the experts out there to see what they think about what is happening during this whole COVID-19 crisis. We are joined by Dr. Mike Villarreal from the UTSA Urban Education Institute. Of course, he's a former Texas representative, ran for mayor of San Antonio, but now the Urban Education Institute is studying students and how they learn. Am I explaining that right, Mike? Yes, you are. You are. How, how they're experiencing distance learning during this time of COVID. Explain what you hope to, to find out in this whole thing. We, we want to understand how students um, are experiencing the distance learning uh, requirement. Uh, we have a, a big urban community, a very diverse set of public school students and, and the families they come from uh, are all uh, in different neighborhoods and have different socioeconomic circumstances. And we wanna help our school districts uh, plan for the next semester. And so we're, we're trying to collect data to understand how students have learned during this period. And, and, and we also want to find answers to questions like, you know, what is distance learning good for? What is it not good for? Uh, because we suspect that distance learning is going to continue with us to some degree. And, and there may be another crisis in our, our near future that we need to be prepared for. Uh, but, but this technology of connecting to the classroom, connecting to teachers, connecting to lessons um, is, is a, a, a real innovation. Um, there's a whole lot of experimentation taking place and we wanna make sure that our education leaders take advantage of it and learn from it. How concerned are you uh, that, you know, there's no playbook on this pandemic and how it should be handled when it comes to our students and when it comes to our kids? How concerned are you that some kids are going to fall behind in this process? I, 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 I am very concerned that we're going to see a, a greater widening of the achievement gap in education uh, between the, the haves and the have nots. Uh, school is, I believe we're going to look back and discover 
a very important equalizer. It's, it's a place where all kids can go and find caring adults, can connect to their peers, can have focused, structured time to read, to study, to learn, to communicate. And, and in this new scenario that we're all living through, um, that is taken away. For some students, it's not a big deal. At their homes, they have a, the technology, they have a, 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 their own desk, they have the workspace, they don't have to share a computer, they don't have to get a job to help the family. They're gonna continue to progress, maybe not as much as they were previously. But for the children who maybe are now finding themselves as the main uh, breadwinners because mom and dad have been laid off or um, are not considered critical workers. The fast food industry is employing a lot of our teenagers and, may, and a lot of them are not keeping up with their studies. Um, they're providing for their families. They, they have very spotty internet connection and, and low uh, familiarity and self-efficacy with computers for those particular kids their learning is, I'm, I'm concerned, is going to drop off. And that has to actually do with our first question that we have from one of our viewers tonight. It's many households can't afford some of the technology or extra bandwidth needed for long term distance learning. What are schools doing to assist students in need? Uh, you know, I, I want to give a cheer to our school districts. They are all hustling and and uh, experimenting with ways of closing the digital divide. Um, I, I can tell you that VIA and SAISD uh, have rigged their buses and, and driven them into neighborhoods where we know there is uh, low participation in broadband subscription. Um, Southwest ISD has turned their public buildings into uh, mega Wi-Fi centers, and so students and families can drive up their cars to connect. SASD has raised money and found money in different uh, uh, accounts uh, and reallocated it to buy technology, laptops, tablets, to distribute it to their students. There's been a lot of hustle to close the digital divide. However, having technology, having access to Wi-Fi is not enough. Uh, there are a whole lot of other family circumstances that impact learning. And, and so uh, I'm afraid we're going to see a, a greater kind of diversity of experiences during this period. All right, next question. With the school year ending early, how are students getting their final grades and how will that affect them moving on to the next grade? Yeah, grading policy is, is district by district and in some cases uh, school by school so it's, it's going to vary um, everything is being communicated online uh, um, or through the mail uh, so school districts are are both um, allowing their students to see grades uh, if the assignments are being graded online through secure accounts and and of course uh, report cards are are also being mailed out I want to talk about college students now in this next question. Alamo College has just announced a plan to keep students in school and on track by giving out scholarships, which would cover tuition and fees and allow them to use financial aid for living expenses. Do you see other schools implementing similar plans? Uh, I do. I do. I think we're, we're, we're again going to see a lot of experimentation on um, adjusting, adapting to this new period. And, and really, it represents a, a natural experiment um, where we are seeing interventions to deal with this situation that had never been tried before. You know, take, for example, SAT scores. Uh, schools are, are communicating to students that when they apply, um, they do not have to submit their SAT scores. Not all of them, but a lot of colleges who, who always accepted and, and included SAT scores, ACT scores as part of the admissions process are putting a pause on that. And, and so it, it creates an opportunity for us education researchers to see, huh, does that really make a difference? Are we gonna see a different uh, success rate of students, a different uh, uh, group of students getting into schools 
And are we going to see different success rates going forward? Maybe we're going to learn that some of the things that we were doing before that we thought were really important because we always have been doing it a certain way aren't as important. Interesting. All right, final question for you. What do you say to parents out there who are concerned about distance learning and how much their kids are getting out of this whole experience? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it is really important to be an advocate for your child and, and to, to, to see and observe how are they spending their time. Um, uh, it, I think this is an opportunity to sort of go back to the basics and encourage students to just read a book. Uh, if they have a musical instrument, just try to, to practice, um, uh, to do things that maybe they didn't have time to, to uh, take on uh, before this event. Now, maybe there's some time to learn how to you know, take out grandma's sewing machine, uh, uh, learn how to, to cook a meal. I would say try to uh, fill your child's uh, time with activities that they are drawn to naturally and encourage that. Look for the opportunities, not the drawbacks. That's right, yeah. absolutely. All right, Urban Education Institute at UTSA, Director Dr. Mike Villarreal, thank you for your time tonight, Mike. Thank you, Steve. We'll be right back. VIA operating its essential service schedule, it basically modifies VIA's schedules to accommodate routes that are used more frequently. VIA says it's an effort to help people traveling to and from work, to get groceries, to help care for others. You can find a full list of which routes are impacted right now on KSAT.com. And a reminder, HEB is operating under new store hours. All stores will now be open from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. The grocery chain all had temporarily limited hours to help keep shelves stocked. Most pharmacies will continue to operate from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and normal weekend hours. You can read more about how HEB and other stores have responded to the pandemic right now on KSAT.com. Well, this pandemic has forced us to make some major changes in our plans, among them wedding plans. Paul Venemer reports that instead of big ceremonies, many couples settling for a simple courthouse wedding. Empty hallways are the norm here as a result of the pandemic. Courtrooms are empty since many judges are conducting hearings remotely, but there have been some exceptions. Case in point, a recent morning in Judge Velia Meza's courtroom. Crystal, take you, Michael. We did have other plans. It wasn't exactly what we planned, but it's something we definitely wanted to do. Michael Bragg and his fiance Crystal's other plans did not include a courthouse wedding. They were going to do something big. After they started limiting the amount of people gathering, we said, well, we'll, we'll have to do it later. And then we just decided to go ahead and do it right now. The way many other couples have been doing when the pandemic restrictions were put in place, license in hand, they headed to the courthouse. It was just a lucky thing that we had a judge here that, that would do it. As for their other plans? We're still gonna have a ceremony and a celebration when things clear up. Um, and in the meantime, I get to be married to this guy, so pretty excited about that. Congratulations, you make his surprise. From all appearances, she's not the only one who's excited. I'm happy. <laughs> Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. Congratulations to the yeah. happy couple. Meantime, let's take a live look outside. It was a pretty nice day today, but we've got some action in our viewing area. Adam? Yeah, we do. And that thunderstorm complex has weakened a bit. It's not at severe criteria, not at severe levels at the moment. So max sustained winds or max winds of gusts associated with it under 60 miles per hour and no damaging size hail either. So here's a look at that. Mainly it's just some good heavy rainfall that's making its way toward I-35 south of San Antonio there as, a, as it approaches basically the Pearsall Dilly area. This is a good rainstorm with a lot of thunder and lightning still associated with it. But again, on the leading edge where you have the strongest wind, you may have some gusts around 40 to 50 miles per hour, not at the severe levels, not at the severe criteria. But moving into Sabinal right now, you got some decent rainfall and a lot of lightning here around Lakey and Southern Real County. Uh, basically up and down 83 is where we have this good rain with a lot of snap crack, snap crackle and pop associated with it. It's moving to the east southeast at about 40 miles per hour. So that would put it in divine, at least what's left of it 
in Divine at 11.37 p.m. Natalia, well, similar time, but 11.45 p.m. And even Hondo, you could see this around 11.24 p.m. If we get any remnants of it, some leftover rain, it wouldn't surprise me if we get clipped by some of it here in San Antonio. I think it'd be uh, after midnight, just a little after midnight. So this is a fast moving complex. It was severe, especially in Valverde County, uh, Kinney County and parts of Uvalde County, but it has since weakened a bit. Still some good rain associated with it, and that's headed into the Pearsall area. Uh, basically momentarily, it's not that far away. Pearsall. It's headed into Frio County right now, that leading edge. So I want to look at our future cast, not just for the rest of the evening. That does show that complex basically falling apart by 2 a.m. south of San Antonio. But tomorrow morning, we'll start the day with some low clouds, maybe even some patchy fog, then some afternoon sunshine. We get into Wednesday, and that's when a cold front drops in. And with that cold front, watch what could happen early Wednesday morning. We have the potential of some isolated thunderstorms Wednesday morning. We'd be on the tail end of the action here. Notice 2 a.m. Wednesday, most of that action far east of town. But we can't rule out getting clipped by some of it on Wednesday morning with that front. 77 right now. Dew point is 67. Temperatures mostly in the 70s. Castorville still at 80. Floresville, you're 78 and 82 in Carrizo Springs. Dew points have been on the rise. That humidity, it's back, but it's not here for good because of the cold front that's going to hit us on Wednesday. It'll sweep away the humidity. A nice gusty dry north wind on Wednesday. So for Thursday and Friday, a big lack of humidity in the air and some cooler mornings as a result. 71 tomorrow morning, 89 by the afternoon. Looking ahead, Wednesday, gusty north wind, that morning chance of showers and storms, 86. And then Thursday and Friday mornings, look at that. We'll be back down in the 50s. So early risers having that nice crisp feel to the uh, late April, early May air. And then this weekend, the humidity returns. Thank you, Adam. Still ahead, two local labs shifting gears, their effort to keep hands healthy for medical workers during COVID-19. And there are more opportunities for hackers to jump on the internet with you. The tips to keep your cyber activity secure, next on the Night Beat. Local scientists taking matters into their own hands to protect the hands of workers in the medical system. Two labs at UT Health San Antonio are now dedicated solely to making hand sanitizer for UT health care providers. The sanitizer meets all World Health Organization guidelines using high purity alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, uh, glycerol, and water. The sanitizer is specifically for frontline workers being distributed to UT health offices across the San Antonio area. With so many people working from home and kids doing schoolwork on the same internet connection, your Wi-Fi is probably working over time. For hackers, that's an opportunity. They're looking for ways to steal your personal information or your company's information. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz with some ways to stay cyber safe. This is a lot of us now working from home. Cybersecurity, something your company would normally deal with, now falls on your shoulders. So what can you do to minimize risk of hackers? It starts with your router. One of the most important things you can do is lock down your router by keeping its firmware up to date. When a manufacturer rolls out a firmware update, it often includes a security fix specifically designed to keep hackers out. Instructions on how to update routers vary by brand, but you update most of them through a website or app. Another thing you can do is change the default password on your router and don't share it with the neighbors. The best passwords are long random strings of words with numbers and symbols. If you have trouble remembering all your passwords and who doesn't, consider using a password manager to help you keep track of them. Consumer Reports recently tested several password managers and found one password was the best option. It's also important to keep your antivirus software up to date. And finally, experts recommend enabling two-factor authentication on accounts anytime it's available. It's one more layer of security as you work from home. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. A festival, a festival for beer going virtual. How would how it would all work coming up? A local upholstery business switching its focus to mask making. European Artisan Upholstery, located near St. Mary Street in McCullough, 
They are taking mask orders by phone to try and stay in business. So one of the many stories you'll find on KSAT.com, our web team keeping track of the coronavirus pandemic with the latest numbers and the many efforts underway to help our community through this trying time. We have an entire page dedicated to this effort. It's all online at KSAT.com. All right, check this out. The New Hampshire Brewers Association planning a virtual beer fest to help thousands of workers in the industry who are now out of work. Instead of going from tent to tent, festival goers will go post to post online, giving them a chance to interact with the breweries. There are also ways to get your hands on the beer itself with delivery options available. Will they have Caskey Ale, though? That's what I, I want. I think that's know. an exclusive to San Antonio. Yeah, really. Yeah. That is or is it Caskey yeah. Lager? It's Therm Thurs IPA and Sticky Sandal. <laughs> Sticky Sandal is our brewery. Sticky. Sticky Sandal? Yeah, because when we brew in the garage, our feet stick to the ground, oh, you know, because okay. of the sticky work. Okay. Anyway. Glad you clarified. <laughs> sticky sand. <laughs> and your foot slips out of your chancla, you know? Yeah, okay. Gotcha. All right, so we have some uh, heavy rain, a little bit of lightning thunder headed toward Pearsall and I-35 south of San Antonio. Nothing severe right now. I got him distracted talking about beer. <laughs> I should have known better. That's it for the night beat GMSA at 4.30. Good night.